Okay, so let's start for today, which is one of the last uh, classes that we have in the classroom. Uh, with the, in, the, in, in two weeks, uh, we will close the lectures and all the time will be devoted for the projects. Uh, I would uh, just uh, like to spend two minutes to summarize uh, some events that will happen in the next two weeks. Some of them are just uh, outside the regular schedule and uh, um, I just wanted to mention them. I already, most of them are already sent uh, messages for them just to explain. Uh, today, at the end of uh, today's class, uh, which will be on Python and databases, okay, which is one of the topics that you asked for, and uh, we added that in the schedule, and uh, in two weeks you will have the Android uh, examples. Hmm? That are the two uh, additional topics. At the end of today's class, uh, there will be two probably one or two engineers from the uh, IT area in Politecnico. Uh, and there are those persons that are currently managing the database of all the timetables uh, for the classes and for the exams, okay? So for all the groups uh, that need to manage this kind of information, they will be here to explain you what are the current uh, APIs uh, that uh, you can use uh, I, I asked them, uh, I don't know if you already saw on GitHub, there is a small Python file that already makes these kind of queries. So there are two APIs currently, and, uh, but uh, they are, uh, th these people are available to, to discuss with you with uh, maybe uh, they are even able to provide additional APIs depending on what you actually need. Okay, so they will be explaining us uh, what they already have they already told me that those APIs that are described in the Python code and that they will describe later are open for everybody to use. So it's not a secret. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you can use them and you can uh, say, tell them that, that, tell anybody that they are existing and they probably they, they are also available to develop new API if it's needed, but uh, we will discuss it later. So for all groups uh, that need to work with their class schedules, and exam schedules, which are not ready yet, but will be uh, soon. Hmm? Uh, I remember also that today is the, the closing day for deliverable number three, so that during the next day we will review uh, that part, uh, and on Monday we will uh, have the long and tiring discussion about uh, uh, the, the last, uh, the, say, formal step of the deliverable three in, in Ladispe on, on next Monday, okay? But uh, hopefully you will have, uh, while you're waiting, I say, to discuss the number three, you are already starting to have uh, practical work to do, actually both coding and uh, playing with devices. We are actually entering the real part of the course, okay? Next Thursday will be a special day. Um, you will have to present uh, the, your project uh, in uh, a short, short talk, we call that a, a final project review. So at that point, uh, so next Thursday, the design phase, the conception, the idea of the project and how to realize it should already be say, fixed. After that, uh, ideally, you should only, uh, only <laughs> uh, in quotes, uh, have to work uh, to implement it. Okay, so that should be the point in which you present publicly to all the class and to us uh, what is your project about. It's a sort of a short presentation, five minutes per group, no more because otherwise we won't fit into uh, one hour and a half and try to highlight the uh, main points hmm, of your project. Uh, I know I'm going to regret this, but uh, if you want, uh, uh, I can provide a sort of uh, outline or template for the presentation just to, to guide uh, uh, how to make or not to make this kind of presentation. But the idea is uh, to explain to somebody who doesn't know it, what is the goal of the project, what does it accomplish, and how it works. So plan in the five minutes uh, to spend two minutes to explain why and what, and uh, two or three minutes to, to explain how. Hmm? How and what are you planning to show at the demo? Uh, hopefully there will be also people from the I3P incubator, so the tutors that are following the startups. If they can come and listen, they will, 
uh, I still have no confirmation for the, for the first part, but for sure, in the second part at 5.30, there will be a seminar from the director of the incubator. It's uh, um, uh, Massimiliano Cealio, uh, who will come us and talks, uh, talk to us and to you about uh, the possible next steps about your project. So how to translate and to transform a project into a product. So if some of you is in the mindset of, uh, uh, of startups and or, or, or entering the market with something, uh, they will reason without, uh, uh, with us about steps uh, that translate a technology project, something that we are proud of, into something that we can profit from, hmm? and if possible. Then there is another uh, meeting for the people uh, we will, uh, we, we know, sorry, who needs uh, who need to work with the noise. So there are, there are at least two groups uh, that that I'm aware of that are uh, uh, working on this topic. One is the no, no noise group, and the other are the people that are trying to estimate just using noise, using uh, the microphone, so on. So for these two groups, uh, I will fix a, a meeting with Arianna Stolfi. That will be Monday 18th uh, at La Dispe. So we will have the from 4 to 5.30 in the normal working time for you. And at 5.30, we, she will join us in La Dispe and she will uh, discuss a bit in the corner. She already has some, 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 a lot of work done on this topic. Uh, by the way, this topic, classrooms and noise, uh, are uh, open to everybody who is interested, of course. Okay. So mainly for these groups who had, had this need, and, uh, uh, but uh, everybody who is interested in general, of course, can, can listen. Um, there are still, uh, just to, to not, not to forget them, at least uh, two points, uh, two other items that need to be, um, say, uh, discussed with people managing them in the Polytechnic. One is the um, uh, access points. So knowing uh, uh, about the Wi-Fi access points, uh, some information for understanding the position of the user or the number of users in a given area. Uh, so I'm still organizing this, uh, um, this meeting for, uh, with the person. One information that I already have is that uh, it's a negative information. There is no data about the localization of access points. So there is no map or information or something that for where we know all the access points, uh, where all the access points are located. So forget it. You know, if you're trying to rely on this information, we, we will not have it because the, the AT area doesn't have it because the, the installation went in rounds and uh, I said the, the history has been lost. They are now changing replacing most of the access points, uh, and so now they would, but uh, that they are tracking them, but it's information that will be available only next year. But there will be some options, uh, at least for understanding how many users are connected to each of them. So we don't know where they are. You need to, say, uh, measure that on the field, uh, but at least uh, how many users are connected on which access point is something that, in some form, that the is trying to, to understand will be available in some way. The other topic, uh, for which I'm still waiting for a reply because I already contacted the person, is about the maps. Okay, so there will be two more meetings, one about the access points and then one about the availability of uh, uh, map information, cartography information about uh, Polytechnic. Hmm? That, and that should probably close the, the needs. Uh, on Monday, we'll bring to the display the, the, the smart card reader for those one or two groups that need it, and I uh, think should be everything that you need uh, to make a successful project. Hmm? Okay, so it's a lot of, uh, we are shifting from theory to practice, of course, the, in these weeks. Uh, but remember, next Thursday will be the special day. Okay, uh, the turning point of the, of the project, of the course. So let's uh, talk about a bit about uh, how to use databases in Python. Um, In general, what we want to accomplish here is uh, uh, to give the ability of a Python application that may be a standalone application, 
or um, a web application to store and retrieve some information from a persistent storage somewhere. By the way, the same uh, idea also applies, uh, let's, for example, to Android applications or to Java applications or to any kind of PHP application. The, the architecture is the same, okay? So we are, of course, uh, uh, describe me for Python and the libraries that we we'll see will be for Python, but the concepts are general and are, and are translated very easily. Hmm? So why? Why do we need uh, to, to consider databases? Uh, well, basically to make some data persistent. So we know, thank you. We know how to um, save some information, manage information, let's think about web application, for example, uh, and to store information into session containers so that the information exchange between the user and the system can persist until the end of the session. But right now we have no way of, we don't know any way eh, of uh, storing information that can persist to a reboot of the server over, or a reboot of the machine. Hmm? Because uh, every information we are current, that we are currently managing is in memory information. We could start inventing uh, some fancy ways of storing information into, into the file system, into files. For example, in the music reader, Exa the music player example, uh, the database of the information is uh, read from files, from the directory uh, actually, and the met that, uh, files metadata every time the application is started. Okay? But this is not a real storage. Hmm? It's just uh, one trick of storing some, of retrieving some information from, uh, say, raw, low level files. And uh, we need a database uh, when we want to manage big amounts of data. So maybe not necessarily all the data fits in memory at the same time. If you have one million songs, then that approach of scanning the directory and uh, pu pulling everything into memory will not work. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Python is a powerful language. And so with the Python lists and dictionaries and so on, you can do uh, complex things, complex stuff. But uh, uh, a database with the SQL uh, instructions uh, is, uh, uh, of course, more uh, advanced and can do more complex things. Just imagine having a Python uh, lists uh, and if you want to make a join, so maybe comparing uh, the elements of one list for which one attribute is equal to another, or you end up writing loops uh, and uh, losing yourself in loops. And while in SQL, you just write one clean statement and you do the, and you let the database do all the hard work of get of uh, browsing data, comparing them, and doing it in the most efficient way. Hmm? So we want to exploit persistence, scalability, and uh, uh, expressiveness, power of, of SQL, hmm? and add that to, to our application. So of course, uh, the solution is always add one more layer. In this case, we will add three uh, to our application. So imagine your Python application or your Flask application, so in the standard context or in the uh, web context, is the same. And you want to access some data that is stored in a database. Uh, currently, we will consider two types of databases. One is real databases. So some storage, maybe big, maybe strong, which is managed by a specific software that is called a DBMS, Database Management System. And this DBMS software has the task of managing databases and tables and uh, rows inside tables and accessing them and so on. So it will be a special server, an additional server inside your architecture. And your application needs to talk to the server to manage the data. Okay? So we will install, we are using, for, as an example, MySQL, which is the most uh, say, popular one, open source uh, database. 
<coughs> it's a separate server which runs uh, its, the, its own process and uh, has its own open port for, for sending queries and so on. So it's a sep separate process with respect to your application. And manages data in, the, in a more efficient way. And it consumes quite a lot of resources. The other option on the other, say, end of the, spec on the, of the complexity spectrum is something much simpler. Maybe your application is quite simple. Maybe it needs to conserve memory, but you don't have a lot of data to manage. And so your database would be maybe smaller. You have less requirements. You want a, a simpler architecture and so on. So maybe uh, all of your data just fits uh, into a file. So there is this option, it's called SQLite. That is uh, basically one database in a file. You don't have a real server, you just have a library that you include in your application. And this library reads and writes from the file. You don't read and write that file, you don't understand it, it's, uh, it's encoded in a way we don't need to know. We have a library that look like, looks like a, a database, so it can execute SQL queries with some limitations, but then doesn't talk to an external server. You don't need another process for running the database and starting it and giving credential and so on. You just uh, say to this database, use this file to store the data. So it's simple. For it depends. Uh, it's mainly a, a, an architectural and scalability issue. Whether it's this database needs to have more data, needs maybe to have to be accessed from many different applications at the same time, then you need a robust solution. But it's something that you only want to manage some private data for one application, then maybe it's easier to go this way. The good part is that uh, both, uh, uh, well, to, a, to an extent, not uh, for 100% compatibility, but to an extent, uh, both uh, ways uh, share the same high-level view. There is a specification in Python that is called the uh, Database API Definition, the PEP249. Um, it's a document in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Python community process that defines uh, the API for accessing databases. And uh, it is just a document, it's paperwork. Nothing, there's no, no, one, no lines of code here. But then there are modules, which are actual Python libraries, that try to be compliant with this uh, interface. The end point is that uh, if you learn this uh, interface, then you reason in the same way, and you call the same functions, well, not the same, functions called uh, in the same name, with the same name, so equally named for functions, in the different cases. So the interface for talking to the Python library, able to talk to the MySQL server, and the interface talking to the SQLite, the Python module, able to manage the file, actually is the same, or is very similar, hmm? because they both are uh, say inspired or try to accomplish this uh, specification. This is not true for all the implementation of data connection modules. So only because some developers think uh, that they are more clever or whatever, and they don't implement uh, this API, and so those modules have a different interface, methods that are called different, and so on. We, we don't care about those. Hmm? We stay with the two main ones. So the, the, this is the comparison with the, the reference. Uh, MySQL is an open source database server, so full features. It's a separate process. So you, you need to install that and activate it in your initialization, in init uh, sequence of your uh, PC or your, or your Raspberry. Um, create a database, give the access uh, permissions to the user, and so on. Possibly may also be on a different computer from the one that is running the application. So you have one computer in which you run the database, another in which you run the application. If you have some performance issues, maybe. So you want the database to be in a very strong machine. 
Um, if you look uh, for MySQL, always try to go to the dev.mysql.com website and not to the www.mysql.com because the w, uh, www website is the commercial one. You will find the commercial version of MySQL, which is sold by Oracle, and you won't find the link for the open source downloading. So always go to the developer site, dev.mysql.com, where you can download it. And uh, again, about SQLite is a very simple, simple, no, not so much, but is a, uh, from the architecture point of view, it is just a library that you include in your project and uh, 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 stores the information in a file-based uh, storage. The main advantage is that it's self-contained. Your Python program, if it uses, if you, if you use SQLite, will just run. You don't have any system requirements for having a SQL server installed on the same machine with such database loaded and with such, uh, uh, say, user uh, um, permissions. Uh, because everything is inside your program. Then if you look at SQLite, there are, there are also distinctions whether there's a version which is pure Python and another with, with a C portion, which is faster, but these are details. For, for now, we don't need them. There are other options, of course. One uh, notable one is the Maria or MariaDB, which is a fork of, Mar of MySQL. MySQL was developed as, as an open source project. Then this project was taken over by some microsystems, and then some microsystem was bought by Oracle Corporation. And as you know, Oracle as the as the main product, uh, the main product of Oracle is a that is an enterprise grade database. So a lot of people got worried for the open source future of MySQL when the uh, owners of MySQL already sold a commercial product that did the same thing, that it was a database. So it's a sort of a, a, a big company corporation having two products that are in competition with each other. So the, or the initial developers of MySQL just went away, didn't accept, uh, say, working for Oracle, for free, by the way, uh, and they started this MariaDB, which uh, forked the, so the code because it was open source, and it still is, and now it follows a, a separate developer stream. But there are, 98% compatible, so they are plug and play. In many uh, Unix, Linux distribution, you will find MariaDB, but the documentation for MySQL always apply, also applies to, to it, so they are quite aligned. Hmm? So if you read Maria and uh, use uh, MySQL or the other way around, uh, don't worry. They are, up to now, they are still very aligned. Another database, and completely independent and competitor with MySQL is Postgres. Uh, as they was uh, more complex and more powerful at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a bit less uh, uh, tools around it because it's a bit less popular, but it's another choice uh, that you can consider. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole world of non-relational databases that in many cases can be useful because when you need just to store some data, you don't want to care about creating schemas and indexes and primary keys and so on. But we will not let enter into this. Uh, here, hmm? because that's actually, and they're um, very, very used, uh, by the way, in the in the IoT applications today. Okay, let's go down to PEP, hmm, to the specification. Uh, this specifies another API that other Python modules should implement. So they, they're saying, if you, any developer, wants to implement an interface to a database, please implement these methods with these names and these parameters. Uh, you can provide any library or module, and you have a lot of third-party modules that may or may not adhere to the specifications and may implement them perfectly or more or less or partially and whatever. Hmm? Um, so this, the specification is uh, actually, if I can open it, uh, no, it's not in this window, it's here. Uh, it's a document which is not, not well, it's longish but not extremely long, and it basically defines uh, uh, a 
type of uh, module interface that is based on two objects, connections and cursors. We will see the details in a moment. And uh, uh, so every module that implements this uh, should uh, implement this kind of these two objects huh, for talking to databases and speaking to databases. Uh, here. So uh, everything is, uh, every dialogue between the Python program and the database goes through an object that is called a connection object. So imagine that uh, your, your application and uh, the database are in, separ in separate places, separate processes or separate computers. So before exchanging information, you need them to connect, to create a connection between the application and the database. This is the general, the abstract view, of course. In the case of SQLite, you already have the file there. But in some way, you still think in terms of connecting with the database. A connection is a sort of a, a pipe where you can flow information in both directions. A sort of a, it's more powerful, more complex than a socket, but it's a, a bi-direction uh, way for transferring information from the application to the server, database server, and from the database server back to the application. And what flows in both directions? Well, from the application to the database, queries flow, SQL statements flow. And from the database to the application, the results of the such queries will flow back. So the data, the table. Hmm? Um, and uh, uh, the abstraction that PEP does uh, is uh, to have a cursor object. A cursor is the representation of a query that contains the query that you want to execute and the results computed by the database correspond to that uh, query. Uh, so a cursor may actually have two roles. One is uh, executing the query. So everything that comes before the execution and then sending the query to the server, to the database server, and then it, it sort of morphs itself into the result of the query and lets you access the results of those, of the, of those SQL statements that you've just run. Hmm? So you have to, in, in other languages, for example, in Java, you are two different languages. One is the uh, statement and the other is the result set. In uh, Python, they have been collapsed into this cursor uh, notion. Why is called cursor? Cursor is something that goes up and down or back and forth, depending on how you see it, across the possible results. When talking to a database, you should always imagine that when you run a query, select star from users, the result may have 10 million lines, might have 10 million lines. So you practically never want to have all the results at once. It's not what you want. What you want is to be able to read some or one result at a time. So to browse up and down with a cursor uh, through the list uh, of the possible results. Hmm? Because databases work uh, in table. They are relational tools. They work with sets and relations. Programs work with data, statements. They are sequential in nature. Uh, so there are different words. Uh, and the one way of letting the two words communicate is to have a small window for which you can pick uh, to the different parts uh, of a bigger set of results. Uh, and we'll see how it's quite easy. So this is a minimal example, a working example, uh, to, to show how this uh, library works. Right now I'm using the MySQL as an example, but uh, with other libraries it will be the same, okay? Right now it's just uh, an example to show how the PEP interface is structured. So what you want to do is to run a query 
on your database server. So first of all, you must be able to write the query. There is nothing that these libraries will solve. You must know SQL, the SQL language, and be able to write the correct query for getting the information that you need, first of all. Then you create a connection, you execute a query. So a query in Python is just a string. Python doesn't understand this in any way. This uh, execute statement uh, is something that takes this, the query as a string, sends it over the connection to the database, and waits for the database to do a computation. And when the database returns, it will return the results uh, that can be fetched in some, in, with some methods, and uh, the values of the results uh, can be used and analyzed by, the, by your Python code. So actually, the, 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 um, the key statement is this one. This is where the database actually executes the query. But you have a preparation phase, opening the connection, preparing, preparing the cursor, and an exploitation phase, or a closing phase. Well, you actually use the results, you convert them into something that is more, more useful for your program, and then you close the connection and so on. So let's see these steps one, one, in more detail one by one. This is a template. It's all, it will always be the same. Something will change depending on the query, but the order of the operation is the same everywhere. So first step, we need to define the query. Any SQL statement will do. Select, insert, update. I can say delete. Mm, sorry, my... I'm not capable of saying delete. Hmm? So because you, usually you never delete anything from a database. Uh, so let's forget about that statement. Insert, select, and update. We don't care about, uh, usually, create table, alter table, and all the other data definition language statements in SQL. Because usually an application will work with a given database, so the tables are being created by hand or with some tool, by the developer, and not dynamic. We don't create tables dynamically. If you are thinking of uh, creating or altering some table dynamically, think twice or twice, and then change your idea and change your mind because it's not the way to go hmm? in any way. So actually, it's the DML, data manipulation language, inside SQL that we we, we want to use. Select, insert, update. Um, the queries are strings, or queries or statements. We, call, we can call them also statements in the SQL sense, not, uh, um, not Python statements. They are strings, and you just put into a string the content of the query as you would write it uh, in your database examination final or in your, on your, uh, or in your database interface. In many cases, the queries have parameters in them. I want to check, the, give me the data of the user. Select the asterisk from users, but not from all users, only from the one who just logged in, where user ID is 27. This 27 is, is not a constant. It's something that the application derived from a previous step, computation. Maybe the user selected something. So, Inside the queries, there are some values that need to be changed. Uh, in these cases, where, for example, I, if I'm inserting something, I have to specify which are the values of the row to be inserted. But even in select, usually in the where clause, some, some, some where, uh, say, filters are parametric. So in these cases, you use some placeholder. The simplest for, uh, format is percent s as a placeholder. Say, OK, this query, this is not the real query. It's just a template for the query. Then, and these values need to be filled in later on. Hmm? So we define the query. We open the SQL book, write the query, test it interactively with our database. When it's working, we cut and paste it into the SQL program, into the Python program, and put placeholders where our test values were inserted before. 
first step. Second step, connecting with the database. So we need to use a connect method. This is the only constant in this uh, line. Every library will have a connect method that will return a connection object. The actual parameters of the connect method are different depending on the type of database. These are the parameters for MySQL, user, password, host, and database. Uh, for um, uh, SQLite, uh, it will be only the file name, and uh, they change. So they are implementation dependent. They are not standard. And also the package name, of course, is, is different. The only constant is that we have a connect method that gives you a connection object. If there are no errors, connection errors, this object con will uh, be the channel, the pipe uh, for you to talk with the database. Uh, step five, sorry, from two to five. Yes, I'm jumping, jumping ahead. Just to say that uh, connections must be closed. Opening a connection uh, employs some resources on the database server. And usually a database server has a limited number of available connections. 10, 20, 100, depends on the scale of the server. And when it, when it reaches this number of connections, it will not accept anymore. So when you open a connection, always remember to close it. Otherwise, your program will run for 20 seconds, and then the database will run out of connection. So that's why step five is here, right after step two. When I'm writing connection connect, immediately write connection close in the line after, and then put all the rest of the code in between. <coughs> uh, never forget to close the connection. If you start writing the code and thinking about the logic of your program, you will always, for, you are for sure you will forget to close it. Connection will close, of course, when the program ends, but in the case of the web application, will never happen, or when it times out, the connection times out. But it will may take 10 minutes or 20 minutes for the socket to die, and uh, in the meantime, the, the database will not, uh, will count the connection as open because it doesn't know that you are has no way the database has no way of knowing that you want you are not willing to use that connection anymore. Hmm? This is a, a consequence of a word much different from the web. In the web, we have HTTP connections, short-lived, without memory. In the database world, we have long-lived connection. I open a connection, you know, imagine a a bank clerk at this terminal, it fires up the program, opens the program opens a connection to the mainframe at 8.30 in the morning, and that connection will stay open until uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One connection for eight hours. In databases, uh, I open a connection, and in that connection I do all the work. It's the opposite from, a, from HTTP. We are, when you are encapsulating uh, the connection to the database into our HTTP world, we need to remember to close, open, we will open and close a lot of connections, but always remember to close them. Okay, um, then we go on, so we have the open connection, and we didn't forget to write the closing statement, and we can think about the query, executing the query. For executing the query, you need a cursor. And the cursor is a statement that will run on a connection. So it will be the connection that gives you the cursor. Connection is the pipe. The cursor is the shuttle that goes back and forth on this pipe. A given connection may have many cursors. So you ask for the connection, give me a cursor because I want to send a query. So it gives you the, the small shuttle and you put the query inside and send the shuttle to the server. So you create the cursor and you put the query inside the cursor and send it, execute, go. The query is navigates to the database server and uh, uh, the database will execute it. If the query is uh, static, that's enough. If the query is parametric, so it contains placeholders, 
you need to specify the actual value of the placeholder. Now I need a number because I want to execute a query. The query must be executed, so I don't, I need to replace the placeholders with actual values. And so the second parameter of the execute statement is a, a tuple. So in Python, you have a list of values in square brackets, I'm sorry, in round brackets, in parentheses, where you list all the values for the different placeholders. So the first value will replace the first placeholder, the second value will replace the second placeholder, like when you are formatting strings, more or less. But this is not just string formatting because it, don't, it doesn't only do string substitution, it's or it's also capable of doing type conversion, plus other security checks. So second, second parameter, first parameter is the query string with placeholders, and second parameter is a tuple with all the values to be substituted into the placeholders. Beware, if, if the string has only one placeholder, you need to create in Python, a tuple with one element, right? And so you cannot just have one element in parentheses because that would be just a number or a string. The parentheses will be interpreted as parentheses for arithmetic expression. Hmm? So you need to tell to the Python interpreter that this is a tuple. And so you need to put a training comma here, this one in red. This trailing comma is for telling to the Python interpreter this is a tuple with one a tuple with one element. If you have two or more, then it's automatic. It's only if you only have one, you require it. If you don't put it, you will get a very strange error that doesn't tell you anything near the real reason uh, of the problem. Okay, just a detail which is not very well documented, by the way. Okay, so we, we, have, exec we, are, we have completed the query, because we have the, the template of the query, we substitute the placeholders, and we send it to the server. The server will do the computation, and of course, depending on the type of query, different things may happen. If it's a selection query, the select statement, that query will probably have a result, select, uh, queries from some values. So the cursor method, the cursor object, gives us a, a set of methods for um, analyzing, I, I would say querying, but it's not, the, it's not the same meaning of, of the SQL query, for analyzing uh, the content of the result. So for example, there's a fetch one method that is a sort of a next method. Every time I call fetch one, it will give me the next result. So imagine a selector creates a table with so many columns as select items and as many rows as the database knows. And every time you call fetch one, you will get the next row of this big table. And this will be encoded in Python as a tuple. Tuple, the first element will be cor correspond to the first column, the second element corresponding to the second column, and so on. And uh, the next time you call fetch one, you will get a different tuple with the elements for the second row, and so on. Hmm? If you want uh, to have all the results at once, you can call fetch all. You hope this the query will not, will not be, the query result will not be huge, otherwise fetch all will be very heavy and time demanding. So only if you know that the, the result is small. And then in that case, you will have a, um, all of the results at once as a list of tuples, a list of tuples. If you are query, and then you can do whatever you want or whatever you need with these results, of course. Other option, if the query is not a select, it will be an insert or update, or delete, no, not delete, insert or update. In this case, there's no result. The query just does something. 
So you don't need to, to do anything after the query, except, except that for efficient reason, efficiency reasons, modifications to the database are not applied immediately. Modifications to the database are just queued up, lined up into transactions. This is a database concept. A transaction is a set of queries that are of modifications mainly, database modifications that are applied at once, all together. Because if you want to do, maybe insert one element, uh, update another one, insert another element into a table, then you have a, a set of related statements that is best and is more efficient if they are executed at once. And so in, uh, um, in Python, you have these uh, automatic transactions. Whenever you send a query, that query is not executed immediately. It's just lined up. It's uh, analyzed by the server. It's executed, but the data are not changed yet. Until, until you tell the database that this transaction is finished and can be committed. Committing mean, means making the modifications permanent. Okay, so if you want to, if you have a set of inserts or a set of updates to do one right after the, after the other, you do all of them and then you commit only once at the end. If you only do one, in, if you only do one insert statement, you must do this, the insert and then commit it immediately. So that the results can show up for the other application, for the other queries of the application. Otherwise. You see that your application inserts some value and you open another window, the values are, are not yet visible. So uh, remember to commit uh, the modification queries with the connection. Commit is a method of connection, not of the cursor. Because it commits all the cursors since the last commit. Mm -hmm. So many, many, many different queries can be committed at once. Don't forget it, or otherwise, if you close the connection without committing, you will lose the data. Not the data, but the updates are not made into the database. So in both cases, whether you are asking for data or if you are changing or applying data, you have something to do after the execute statement. And then also, well, the cursor can be cleaned up. It's an object. If you are, you can use this Close method if you want to reuse the cursor for doing another query, for example, or for freeing the resource. Maybe you have a, you ask to execute a very big and complex query with a lot of joins and nested statements that will consume memory on the database. Uh, so maybe you want, you need to keep the connection open, but you know that those results of that big query are not needed anymore. And that you can tell the database, okay, you can drop these results. I already had what I need. And of course, uh, the, the logical part of the, the application needs to do something with the results of the data. But then we are back in Python, in our, in our application. We know which are the data and uh, we want to decide what to do with them. If uh, we are in a web application, most likely we will need to take this data and put them into JSON to return to the application or put them into some Python object to pass to a template so that they can be included in the, in the web page. If we are in a standalone application, well, it depends, of course, on what you want to do with this data. If you need to do further queries, you can reuse the same connection. Okay, connection, it's a long-lived object. You can run different cursors in the same connection. So you go back to step three, creating the cursor without reopening new connections. Okay, this is the, the theory, the steps that are behind this uh, short template. Um, in practice, what do you need uh, to work? So if you want to use MySQL, first of all, you need to have in your machine a SQL Server running. So in uh, Ubuntu or Debian, so in uh, Raspbian, 
If it's not already installed, uh, you can install it from the package manager. Usually the package is called MySQL server and or MariaDB server, it depends on what you want. Uh, most likely it's already installed, hmm? but otherwise you can install it. Or if you want, you can download the installer from this uh, page. Uh, and in particular, if you are maybe running on Windows or Mac, uh, you need to install it because it's not already there. Hmm? The server. The server just runs there, sits there using memory, and, uh, but you need some application to, to, to connect to the database for doing something useful. And then you need a library, the Python library, that knows that on one end implements the PEP 249 interface API. And on the other hand, knows how to speak to the MySQL server. And you can download this uh, object, this library that is called the uh, uh, connector. So this is the MySQL dev MySQL com page. You have all the downloads here. So if you want to install the server, you can download it from here, community server. In Windows, there is an installer that, that, that gives you everything, but on, uh, on Linux, you already have that in your package manager. Most likely, it will be MariaDB instead of MySQL. But for connecting to Python, there is one library that is called connector slash Python. And you can install it. Uh, you see that uh, from Windows for a different uh, version. For Linux, there will be a deb file. will appear, and uh, it, it will install into your Python, uh, say, installation, um, the package, the Python package that is called uh, mysql.connector. So you can import mysql.connector afterwards. Okay, this is still uh, thinking. Just be careful of downloading the version for 2.7, not the 3 point something version. Always check maybe if you can already import this mysql.connector from your Python installation just to check whether this package is already installed or not. Hmm? So you can install the pip or we, you can download it from the mysql website. But you need this library. And um, a good point is that the documentation from by MySQL is better than the documentation from the Python websites. So if you need to understand how this connector works or how to write queries uh, with using these uh, libraries, I, I, I would tell you to look at the documentation site here on the MySQL server because it's, there are, it's, it has better examples than the one on the, on the PEP uh, document. Hmm? But right now it's sleeping. Hmm? Uh, cannot locate the internet. Interesting. Uh, okay. But you have all the all the addresses. And the other. So the first point is having the libraries that you need: the server and the Python li connector connector library. And then the other difference that we have between the different databases is uh, uh, the connect method that takes different parameters and different forms depending on the database. In this case, uh, the minimal parameters that you need to, to specify are the username. This is the, use, the SQL username. So the database server has its, its, own, its own users. It has a user table with their own credential, which are, which are disconnected from the Linux users. Hmm? It's just a set of names with passwords. And every name, every user has some privileges for being able to read or modify some databases or some tables. This is all the permission systems in SQL. There is one special user that is called root that has all the privileges. And you need to know the password for that, of course, to be able to create new databases and to create new users. And the password of the root user depends if you are installing the server yourself in the installing uh, script they will ask you which password to specify for root. 
Otherwise, if you are installing a package version, you need to look in the documentation. So, that, because there are so many ways, uh, um, there's not a single answer. And there are a lot of additional parameters uh, that are not very interesting that you can uh, uh, see at this page mm -hmm. in the documentation. Database is, uh, since you have, we have a DBMS, like MySQL, that can host different databases at the same time. So you must select which database to use. It corresponds to the use statement in SQL. In SQL, the first thing you do is use and database name. So that all, this, all the following queries will be run inside the context of that database. Here, you select the database at connection time. So you already connect into a specific database from the many databases that may be installed in your machine. Yes, there's a question? Uh, yes and no. Um, the question was, uh, if I have many users that need to modify the same database, uh, do they need to share the, the username? Um, a database can be, can have permissions given to many users. So you may have many user IDs that may technically write and read from the same database. But actually what, you, what we do normally is to create one special user for the application. And so your application will connect to the database with the credential of the application. The, the real user will not have an account in the database. Yeah, on the database, you will have a user table with the application passwords of the user we, that have nothing to do with the SQL credentials of the SQL users. So usually you have one account per application that needs to use the database. So in your web application, all, all the web application will have one account. Even if you have maybe many web pages that in parallel try to access it, they will all access it independently in parallel with the same credentials, with the same password. So it's something that is hidden from the user and not, has nothing to do with the user. If we want to do it with the SQLite, it's uh, even simpler. We do, you don't need to install and download anything because from 2.5, the SQLite uh, library is already included in the default distribution of uh, Python. So you already have a, a module that is called SQLite 3. And you just need to import SQLite 3 and open a connection with the SQLite3.connect. So nothing needs to be installed. It's already there. It's, uh, let's say, all, all included. No, no configuration effort is needed. And uh, the parameter for the connect, the, the minimal parameter for the connect is the name, the path name, of course, uh, of a file in which SQLite library will store or, and query all the information. So this will be a single file that will grow, of course, if you store a lot of data, in which all the information is stored inside. So if you want to transfer your database in some other place, you just have to copy, grab and copy this file. In this case of MySQL, all the information is stored in a set of folders under slash var slash MySQL, slash a folder for each database plus some metadata. It's more complex, not just one file, and you cannot just copy, copy it around. Huh? Here, in this case, it's much simpler. You just connect to the file, and SQLite library will do all the rest. But in any case, you will always have this connection concept. You open the file, let's say you are connecting with the database uh, embedded into that file. So, so, so long for theory. Uh, I would like to show you some uh, um, example that I, I made just to see it in action in our where is that? In our example web application. You remember the echo, the funny echo application. Just to, to show you, 
I, uh, it's quite a stupid idea, is uh, I imagined, so it's here, web app. What I did was to modify the template, you remember, saying hello, I can reverse it. It's a very useful website. And uh, uh, I added a save button here. The idea is that, okay, this uh, translation here is so useful that we want to save it in the database. And then later on, we want to be able to see the list of the all, trans all the translations and so on. Okay? So, um, from the JavaScript side, it's quite easy because we just need to add one button and then uh, if, we, if we are doing this with, with the Ajax, hmm, the, path, the Ajax pattern, we need to apply uh, a, an event handler to the click event of the button. Collect the data and send it to the server with, a, you know, with an Ajax call. Uh, we need a database for storing this information. So what I did was to create uh, one uh, structure, a very simple database uh, with one table. These are the SQL statements for creating the table. Uh, let me take a shortcut because mainly because I'm on Windows. Um, this is a control panel for starting the MySQL server. You could do with uh, sudo init uh, and, uh, and so on with, um, in, in Ubuntu for starting and stopping the server. Once the SQL server is started, I need to create a database. So I could connect in some way to the database and execute these queries and so on. You can connect to the database in different ways. You may have a database well, in command line. So you write MySQL space, your name, database name, and so on, and write statements by hand in the console, which is very uh, demanding. Or you can have a graphical user interface. Uh, in, uh, well, one is, which is very powerful is called uh, uh, PHP MyAdmin, which is actually a, a, a web application running on PHP that connects to MySQL and gives you all the administrative interface for MySQL. Uh, you can install them in, in your server, or you can uh, um, use Eclipse. When you're opening a, a SQL file in Eclipse, you can also connect to some database, in some cases, some MySQL database. And so we let you run the queries on the database and, and see it graphically. So it can be done by using Eclipse as a front end for your database. Um, you just need, uh, it's a bit uh, tricky because you need uh, a connector for Java in this case. Because since Eclipse is running in Java, for Eclipse to connect to MySQL, you need to install the MySQL Java connector. Otherwise, other, uh, Eclipse will not be able to. But uh, I will make it easier for me. I, uh, I like a very small program which is called uh, Heidi SQL, this one, which is a Heidi SQL, which is available on Windows, not on Linux, but right now, and, and there, are, there are others for, for Linux, but, uh, um, which is a very simple uh, front end that can let you, you see that this is the MySQL server running on this computer. I have this uh, a group, some uh, databases installed, hmm? mainly for some are the default ones and some are for the exercise of the other course that I'm doing here. And they want to import a new database. What they could do is to create a new database. Sorry, it's in Italian, but I can change it uh, in English. I don't know why, where did it get the information. Okay, I can create a new database. 
and inside uh, an existing database, I can create new tables. But there are a lot of graphical front ends for doing this kind of stuff. I already have the database ready, so I just need to load this from the Eclipse. Uh, Doesn't find it. Where are you? Mm. Okay. So I loaded this SQL file into this uh, small program. Just need to run it. By running the, the SQL code, I just import the database. So the way for moving a database from one machine to another is on one machine, you export a file with SQL statements that recreate the same database. You transfer the SQL commands, zip because they are big, and you just run the SQL file on the other machine. It will, with, the, with the queries, it will recreate the tables and insert the data again. Hmm? So my SQL dump is called the, the, the command for dumping a, a database into a set of SQL statements. So right now we have this uh, well, funny echo um, database with only one table that is called translation in which I have an ID and an original text and a modified text. This is the structure of the, of the table that has been created, and uh, it's, if I want to see the data, it's empty currently. So I want that every time the user clicks on the send, on save, sorry, one new line should be saved on this database. Hmm? So let's go back to our application and close this SQL statement. There was just a quick way of recreating the table instead of doing it by hand now. And uh, I have uh, the first, uh, oh, sorry, not this project. The first thing I need to do from the beginning, the save button. So we add all the uh, key up function for the text area, for the text input, and hence here. Now I want to register another handler the click event on the save button. So again, we jQuery or register a function that will just get the data from the two text boxes, the text and the modified, and send a post to a translation URI. I'm thinking REST, okay? So I have a translations resource. If I post to a translation, it means I am adding one. If I get from translations, I want to have a list. So right now, I want to add one trans translation. I, I call them this couple of uh, first, before and after text, OK? So I'm creating a, just a post request to save one new translation into the database. I'm in JavaScript here, right? The HS function will send it. Uh, and uh, the only thing we do, we do when, uh, when it succeeds uh, is just to clean up, I, will, I clean up the text uh, errors, just to see that something happened. The words have been saved, so I clean up the errors. And this is the, what I want, what I need, the, the only thing I need to do on the client side. Right now I need to implement this translation method on the server, right? So I go to the web application, and slash translations, I need to register a route for translations and implement a function. The template is the same. You get the data from JSON. You extract the two items that you know that will be there. Text and modified are text and modified, the names of the two attributes. And then, I have these two variables, these two strings. I want to send them to the database, to add them to this database. 
And so I created a queries module that contains all the interface with the database. Don't pollute the web application with all the queries to the database. Make it clean, of course. All, all the web database operations, try to put them into another module because otherwise you will, have, you will have a very long page and totally unreadable. So this is the database operation in this queries insert translation method. And I return the result, and the result in this case is the ID of the newly created item. The database, the table has three fields, ID, before, and after. Uh, I send the two strings and the database will automatically create a new number for me to be referred later. So this number is returned to the caller. What, the, what is this insert translation method? So we have this query module that uses the MySQL connector. And this is just an example of what uh, we need to do. Insert translation is a function that gets the two parameters, before, text before and text after. And we'll run this query, insert into translation. Translation is the name of the table. Yeah. Original modified are the names of the columns of the table. Values, placeholders. This is the string we need to run. This function receives these two parameters that we need to be inserted and pushed into these placeholders. Step one. Step two, connect to the database. In this case, I'm running a, a very unprotected server on my machine with the root uh, user without any password. This is the root of MySQL, not the root of Unix. Hmm? Localhost is the same machine in which I'm running. And database, funny echo. It's a database that I just created. Open the connection, get the cursor, execute the query. SQL is this string, before, after, are the parameters that I received from the web method. They are coming from the jQuery. Hmm? And then uh, I can get uh, this method for the cursor, last row ID, get, give me the ID that has been generated from the last call. I'm not using it actually. And then I clean up. Cursor close, commit, and then close. The last two are the most important one and the most frequently forgotten statement. That's it. So if uh, I want to press save here, what happens is that if I go there into the data, I refresh the and they see that new data was populated into the database. And if I write something else, uh, Thursday, I save it, I go there, and I see new data and so on. HTML, jQuery takes the parameters, create a JSON, sends through an AJAX call to the Python code, Python extracts from the JSON the data, calls a function in the query module. The function in the query module takes the same value and puts them in the right place into a SQL query. And the SQL query is pushed to the database that will execute it and commit it. Yes? The translation table is a, a table with three columns, ID, original, modify. Okay. Ah, so yes. here I'm seeing the, the structure of the table here, or the date of the table, you have three columns, ID, original, modify. I of course, you create the table and you need to insert the table, insert the data according to the column names that you specified, of course. And uh, 
So you, you, it takes some uh, 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 planning ahead. Yes? No, because you need to merge, not to replace it. The question was, if you have a local database on one machine and a general database on a server, how to synchronize them? Uh, you cannot just take... The local databases do not change the most frequently. The root database will download the database. Uh, so the, if you want, uh, you can have, usually you should have a synchronization program where you have, if, if possible, with the, let's say the, 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 the nodes, the mobile nodes, will have to sync to the database, do some queries, and uh, get the results. I think it's very unlikely that the uh, local databases in some way will be identical to the server one. It's, uh, well, maybe some tables are but not all of it, because otherwise it would be something unchangeable. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very specific case. Yes. You, yeah, but if you download it locally, then you cannot modify it anymore, because this modification will be lost. So it depends, it depends on you. Okay, if a SQL life is just uh, transferring the file. If uh, otherwise, if my SQL is just dumping and reloading, uh, but in general, you, you will need to sync. So knowing which data was, were, called, were changed and replay the changes back. Uh, uh, with these databases, we, you, the, uh, it's, not it's also not automatic. Some other databases are able to work in a distributed way so that changes are automatically replicated as soon as the machines connect, but mm, we're not doing it with MySQL. Uh, I also wanted to show you the other two options. Now I inserted some data, right? If I want to query, so I developed in, uh, in, uh, in REST other two methods. One is a get translation, so the same URL, but with a get method. Remember in REST, get on a collection, on a resource means give me the list. And so I implemented this translations get method that calls a get all translations in the queries module and puts together a dictionary with all the, uh, with all the data, which is a sort of a compact Python. And then I don't want to explain it now, but if you want, uh, we, we can spend some time in another time. And the get all, because my focus today is the database. Get all translations is a, give me all the items in the table and then the same template and I receive all the results, fetch all. Return them, what is this translation? Is a Python list of Python tuples, of strings. Not strings, integer, string, string, because the first column is an integer, the ID. The caller gets, uh, say, um, navigate, browse through the list, extracts the three fields, and puts these three fields as dictionary items, because they look better in Python, in JSON, of course. And then I JSONify everything and send it back. The end result, we can see if we, if we try, it's a get, so we can just write, uh, what's the name? Translations. Oops. Uh, localhost. I thousand translations. So I have a JSON with one, only one item, which is the list that on turn is an array of uh, uh, objects. There is one limitation in Flask uh, that you cannot have a, a list at the top level. So you cannot start uh, JSON with a square bracket. So that was this, this useless list uh, uh, attribute. 
because otherwise you get an error. It's a sort of an old security bug from Internet Explorer 5 that they want, they don't want to remove this security measure. Translations. Uh, the other method I, I implemented is the, for getting, sorry, well up, one item. So translations give me the list. Ideally, it could, it could be just the list of IDs. The rest uh, interface could only just give me the list of the IDs, not the real data, but I already had it. And there's another, uh, according to REST, I can do translations slash ID. Translation slash one, slash two. Hmm? And so I have another query, it's a get tr translation only one. The first one was get all translations, get one translation of a given ID. This ID was specified in the URL. Remember REST, as a resource slash resource ID. So get the details of one resource. I put it together in JSON at the end and they, and they return it. And the query, get translation, is uh, select all the fields from the translation table where the ID is the specified number. Placeholder for the ID. And of course, when we do the query, we substitute from th for this uh, placeholder the actual ID text ID that they received. This comma is just for creating the one element tuple that I told you before. In this case, I only have one result, so I can call fetch one instead of fetch all. And I will get only one tuple instead of a list of tuples. And return it back to the web application. Where is it? Here. Uh, result, get translation, and I extract from this result the different fields, and JSONify and send them back. So in the browser, slash translation is the list of resources, translation slash two is the details of resource number two in the translations collection. So basically you have the, the example, the minimal example or templates for uh, inserting, getting the list or getting the details. And these are the three, say, main steps for building all the REST interfaces. Then depending if you want to do the REST, REST or you want to implement uh, the HTML pages, the, the idea is that uh, you always, in your application, you always try to separate the queries themselves that do all the SQL work and all the database work with the application that needs to get the data back and then have just a clean interface. Pass objects, return objects to the database queries. Okay? That's all for today. Let's do a short break and then I already saw the people uh, waiting outside for telling us everything about uh, car schedules. Thank you.